because I met with the parents of the um, students that wanted into the school from the Magnolia almost my first week on the job, I knew I was in for um, you know legal challenges. And I started thinking through kind of what the ramifications of my aggressive stance towards creating diversity in my school. And, and I had some inkling that mm, this issue could go before the courts and would be adjudicated. But I had no real sense of what that would look like in terms of my professional life and how I live my professional life. Um, the night before the decision, I met with the superintendent at the time, Joseph Olchewski, and I said, Joseph, and this was just after a meeting with my Latino community at Ballard, where we talked about equity issues, and they, they um, loudly uh, remonstrated about the, the court decision at that meeting, and I thought, okay, that's what I needed to hear. Let him know about it, and he was, uh, he was concerned, but supportive, and so the next day I made the announcement and I was very careful to kind of um, get to my students and staff first um, because I didn't want to do put this um, put our school into the middle of this without letting them know first so I met with my staff early that morning and then I met with the students early that morning so that the school community were the first to know about this and then as it as it played out um, the court reconsidered their decision and reconvened on Bonk and made a different decision. The court case proceeded from there because the, the PICS folks had deep pockets and a lot of support to take the, the uh, case forward. And the rest is kind of history. It went to the Supreme Court. And for me, the value of the whole project was to open the conversation. It wasn't to settle it or decide it or uh, end it. It was to open it. and. To have kids come to me and say, um, be able to say, I'm completely in opposition to what you did. I think you were wrong, and describe why and to give their reasons. For me, uh, I took a lot of joy from that because I felt like um, there's there's a lot of authority and power in play in these situations. And I think for kids to feel comfortable enough to kind of address the issues that are really um, important there and not pay any mind to kind of the other peripheral mm -hmm. issues around power and authority was very uh, heartening to me. And then I had a lot of students who had been silent on the issue come forward and talk to me about what it meant for them and their families. Um, I had parents from the community show up and interact with me in ways that is not typical of a principal-parent exchange. Um, so I, I felt like it was really a gift in a lot of ways. That Um, for me, it was looking at, I looked at data, and um, way back when I was principal at Interlake High School, I noticed that my Latino students had no traction academically. They had the highest dropout rate, they, they were never on the honor rolls, they didn't uh, enroll for advanced coursework, work. and so I thought, well, what's, what, what can I do directly to kind of work against that? And what I did was I found out who are the leaders in this community, and how can they engage kids in being successful in school. And so engaging that community and then listening to student voice, um, finding out what those students were experiencing in school, and then removing the roadblocks to that, either through providing extra resources like tutoring or just kind of how do you do school in America. Um, lots of folks don't know how <coughs> you do school. It's, it's a not, you know, it doesn't get spread by ESP. You have to learn how to go about it. And one thing I have learned in my long experience now in edu education is we don't listen to our students enough and we don't take them seriously enough and we don't provide structures where that can be an ongoing engagement um, with their educational experience. And the difference. Where I have to uh, kind of hold the line for my notion of diversity is around um, the notion that if we believe No Child Left Behind is important legislation and that all kids in the eyes of the law are equal or at least deserving of an equal opportunity, then we have to look at the forces that shape um, educational resources and experiences for every student. So for me, I look at the things that limit schools' ability to respond to the individual needs of kids. Historically, they have been built around um, 
economics, around race, around culture and ethnicity, those things. Um, and I do know that because, like most terms in, in the public conversation about things that are difficult, that term over time has degraded to mean almost anything. You know, it can mean almost uh, fashion differences. And certainly that's not where I live. I live with around uh, what I call the, the gold-plated American issues of race, class, and, and gender. And uh, you know, when those, those issues get in the way of our kids, every kid being helped ahead, um, then I think we have a responsibility to, to pay attention to those big demarcations. Um, the modern notions of separatism are that um, integration will disempower us as, as people and as a group and will erase, uh, the, diminish w what we value in terms of cultural identity. Uh, here's my problem with that. First of all, I, I, have, I look around the world and I go, where is this working? Um, I don't know of a place where, where kind of this uh, official separatism works. It, it irretrievably ends up in, in a process of conflict and violence everywhere I look. So would I be hopeful that, for that? I'm always hopeful for the best, but if I pay attention to history, I would know that um, good luck, that's not going to happen. So I think that I would rather kind of um, struggle with the issues around the concerns folks have in the, the minority community about loss of identity and cultural um, presence, those are issues I'd rather struggle around than giving up on integration as the way forward. Because I, I think looking at human history, uh, the prognosis is not good if we, if we base our lives on a kind of separate realities. folks, The racial tiebreaker was a tool to achieve an end uh, around integration and school in integration. So I never saw it as an end point. And a, um, from my perspective, it was a tool that was useful at the time. Um, I think it was long overdue. I think it, it had it been tried sooner, it might have been more effectively integrated into uh, kind of the social context of schooling. That being said, it wasn't enough on its own to, to kind of create the schools we've at least I dream of. It's a, a tool, and I felt districts ought to have a, a variety of tools at hand. I think the Supreme Court decision limiting the use of that tool um, creates some powerful problems for urban educators now because there are fewer, fewer tools and a more constrained environment to address the issues that are right in the faces of urban educators that um, race does matter. Um, Poverty does matter. Those things live at your, within your school every day, and you have fewer tools to um, kind of uh, address those issues. So, um, so in terms of patience, I know that change in um, our society is generational, which is difficult to understand for anybody that wants you know, quick results, especially in our society where communication is instant but change is generational. And the kind of significant social change is still, I think, operating in a generational time frame. Um, um, teachers have to develop, and this will be new for teachers, to develop what I call an entrepreneurial social agenda. And that means they have to come into schools and start creating networks for change at a, at a real ground level. They have to find out who else on this staff is interested in significant deep change. How, what can I do today to connect with those people? What can we do tomorrow to change the life for uh, our students and ourselves? And how do we build a vision that's different than what applies now in a way that's uh, safe and constructive? Um,